Ah, é isso. Good morning. I trust that today you're more rested. You got an extra hour of sleep. Uh, we're glad that you're here and uh, I wanna welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're joining us here or online and pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts as we worship together. Uh, today, uh, a gratitude moment uh, is for an event that's coming up and this is called a Bethlehem Walk uh, with St. Nicholas and a community dinner. Uh, Mary, do you want to say anything about it? <laughs> she was smiling and immediately was like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? Right. Thanks, Rula, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Great, great. So if you have nativi nativity scenes you'd like to share, uh, just let us know. You could talk to Mary, you could talk to me, you can just uh, email the office. We already have two sets coming and I know Liz Sala is helping us with this and Liz has over 40 sets from all over the world. And so she's gonna really, uh, she's gonna dominate the scene but we're very excited. And uh, She comes from a Lebanese background which is very interesting because she has a lot of these uh, different from different cultures, which is always wonderful to see how people experience uh, the story of Christmas in different cultures. So today we are beginning a new sermon series. It's called The Soul of Money. For those of you who are here with us for the first time, I'm sorry, your first introduction to our church, we're gonna be talking about money. <laughs> But usually it's one of the topics we don't like talking about and that's why we try every year to talk about it, to be intentional, to say it is something we wanna uh, talk about but I hope we're not inducing any guilt because usually that's what uh, churches have done to make sure that people give to the ministries of the church. And so I found this video and I wanna share it with you and uh, it's about some churches, any of you have gone to a church where they pass a plate? Yes. yes, we don't do that in this service. We don't do it actually in the, in the second service anymore after COVID, uh, and I'm so grateful. Just personally, this is my personal preference is not to pass the plate because it's always like this awkward moment. Do you look at what your neighbor gave? Or if you didn't think of having some cash in your pocket, you're visiting the church and then you're like, oh, I gotta give something. So anyway, this, this kind of gives you a little bit of the history of, of why you know, this practice came about. It's hard to imagine but passing the plate wasn't always necessary to financially support the church. Not until the late 1800s did churches actually count on voluntary contributions to keep their doors open. You see, just like it was in Europe, 
The new government of colonial America established, sanctioned, and financially supported the church. The colonists couldn't see it any, any differently. <clears throat> A prosperous society depends upon having citizens of good character. And where else would this good character come from but the church, of course. Except in 1833, Massachusetts became the last state to rescind its religious taxes. So by then, congregations in the United States had to rely solely on their members for financial support. Pastors came up with all sorts of ways to survive the free market of the 19th century America. Uh, for example, many churches actually sold a pew to their members. That way, a congregant could sleep in, come to church late, and still have a good seat. Then, after the Civil War, something new became popular. Pastors began teaching the biblical principle of tithing. God gives unto us, and we give back to God one-tenth of all that he's blessed us with. Just like that. An act of worship and a commitment. Thoughts, reactions? Yes, Tom. So this week, I happen to be reading one of the history books of this church. Okay. And you know why. Um, when this building here was built, mm -hmm. the original pews, and the ones that are in there now are not the original pews, but the original pews were sold to members, mm -hmm. actually registered in the, the county clerk's office. Wow. And they were owned and paid taxes on to fund the church. Paid taxes on them. Wow. Okay. Interesting. It, you know, so this practice was. And then people didn't pay their taxes, and <laughs> they decided that wasn't a good way to go. <laughs> All right. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. sold to somebody else, and then they found out that that didn't work. So they came up with the offering plate. That's very interesting because you know how you assume certain things have to happen a certain way. When we uh, started the service, I got some pushback saying, you know, we, we don't want to put, we don't want to pass the plate. Could we just put a box there? You know, people could give, people give online, people give in many different ways. We don't want to practice this as part of worship. It was hard at first for people to imagine, you know, a worship Is service. You having your church be repossessed? <laughs> The ultimate. <laughs> Even church didn't work for you. Yes? Uh, in the Church of Scotland, I, I have a token mm -hmm. that was used uh, where they had a counting house in mm -hmm. front, mm -hmm. you know, of the, work, the church. And people had to go there first to pay their tithe before they could get communion. All right. <laughs> All right. So you had to pay your tithe before you could get your token to, to prove that you are, were in good standing and you know, to make money for the church. I mean, it's very interesting. And so today, I hope that as we journey through this, we'll be speaking about money in a deeper way instead of just the ways we tend to speak about money. And because most of us are wounded around money. Uh, most of us have woundings uh, from our uh, childhood. And by the grace of God, we grow up, we learn, we practice different ways of giving, of, of not overspending, uh, but then, or sometimes we don't learn these lessons, and, or sometimes we still have, even if we learn to be frugal, even if we learn to not uh, you know, overspend, even if we learn how to give a lot, sometimes we still carry those wounds or scars from those wounds. Uh, one of the people I really like uh, listening to when it comes to issues of money is a woman by the name of Lynn Twist. She wrote this book, The Soul of Money, and it's, uh, she says, reclaiming the wealth of our inner resources. So she talks about money in a, a universal ways, uh, talking about the issues that impact people you know in your life. Even if you don't have money issues right now, you may have someone in your life who has money issues. Uh, someone you care about who's struggling. Uh, and even if you don't think of that in terms of uh, personal stuff, look at the world uh, and look at the struggles over resources. If it weren't for resources, a lot of the wars we would 
we would we are having today would not happen. And so Lynn Twist says um, says this. Everyone is interested in money, and almost all of us feel a chronic concern or even fear that we will, will never really have enough or be able to keep enough of it. Money is the most universally motivating, mischievous, miraculous, uh, maligned, and misunderstood part of contemporary life. For most of us, this relationship with money is a deeply conflicted one, and our behavior with and around money is often at odds with our most deeply held values, commitments, ideals, what I call our soul. And so she says, our most universal soulful commitments and core values is the well-being of the people we love, ourselves, and the world which we and the world in which we live. We really do want a world that works for everyone, because that's how we're created. That's how we uh, are wired in uh, to be in this world, and to to not have that ability to see that in fruition because money becomes a barrier for us uh, is really an interesting concept. And we can, we can make a difference in the way uh, we behave around money or we connect to money. One uh, tidbit is to think about is that, you know, if you've ever played this game, you know, if you're on a desert island, what would you take with you? What if you had three things you have to take with you? Uh, what are the things you usually name? Food, what is it? Family, okay, I, I like that. Yeah, I've never thought of that one. <laughs> I'm usually <there. laughs> I've usually thought of, see, I'm trained in the objects. I'm thinking of objects, I didn't think of people. <laughs> sure you wanna take family, yes. Think, you know, think about the things that come to mind. Most of the time, I've never played this game where somebody said, I'll take money <laughs> with me. Why? Because money doesn't translate into anything when you're on a desert island where no one is going to recognize your money. Uh, so it's not inherently uh, worth anything until we assign worth to it. And so we can be freed from it when we're able to see it in that universal role uh, of our lives, to, to put it in its proper place as a conduit for grace, for love, for the values that we carry deep within our souls. So I'm going to invite us to take a deep breath and prepare our hearts for worship as we pray together. God, we give you thanks for your grace in our lives, for your presence this morning with us, for the opportunity to speak about one of the sources of our wounding, and yet one of the sources of your grace for us in life. Help us today as we look at this to be infused with that spirit of love, spirit of gentleness, and spirit of generosity and a sense of being enough, of having enough, of living in a world of abundance because of your grace. We pray this in the name and way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. So for our song, Oh Lord, Hear My Prayer, we're going to sing five times. The first time I'm going to sing and then just feel comfortable when you want to join in and sing with me.
And so today, thinking about aligning money and soul, uh, there's a book that I read a few years ago called Your Money or Your Life. And it's a really interesting book because when you think about it, how we think about life's energy and how where we exchange our life's energy for resources, for, for money. <laughs> All right, they're doing okay now. Um, so thinking about that piece, uh, there is a, a beginning, and this kind of, I gave you a little clue of it uh, about the beginning. They begin with a, with a challenge, it's, it's a scenario. They, uh, the writers, uh, Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez, uh, they say, imagine your boat capsized and you swim, you swim to an island in a piranha infested part of the Amazon River. You think you're done for, but then you notice that you have your wallet and it's stocked with money, saved. But you later see two men in a canoe, and then they tell that they're cannibals, actually. Uh, paddle by, and you raise a fistful of dollars, yelling, help, help. But they don't recognize your money, but they recognize you as dinner. <laughs> and so this whole idea is that, you know, sometimes we think money is, is worth something, and it's because we have assigned worth to it. We've agreed to be part of an economy that uses money. And that money wasn't always around. Like money as we know it today was not a thing. People exchanged goods or uh, you know, they had coins, they had silver, they had uh, gold, they, ha they used all kinds of things. And so money in itself doesn't have power. We assign it power. We associate money with all kinds of things. But it's not just about the power of exchanging money. So money is only good when it's flowing. But it's also, think about what you associate with money. What do we associate normally? Power. More money, more fun. Uh, pay the bills, okay. Security, a lot of security issues around money. And we, I mean, anything that triggers security for people usually, whew, a big issue for us. Uh, what else do we struggle with around money? Or maybe just think about it in, in a good way. What do you associate with money? Comfort. Comfort. Generosity. Sometimes you, know, you think about money and you think of people who are amazingly generous. They give so much and they not only give uh, of their resources, but they give of themselves too. So that's another resource. So think about this whole issue of money and its associations and where they come from. And we learn those from early on in life. You know, as a child, if you go back to the time when you were little, and when did you start hearing or getting the feelings around money? Maybe there was conflict in your own household around money, or maybe your parents uh, overestimated people because of their status of money. Or maybe you heard it at school, you know, somebody wearing nicer clothes than you. Well, why can't we wear this stuff? Uh, and it's interesting because sometimes people, I mean, I've heard stories over and over again where people would say, you know, we were really economically poor, but we didn't know it at the time. So, you know, it's, yeah, sometimes it's what you assign value to. Again, it's not because you feel like, oh, we don't have enough money. Now, unfortunately, because of social media and our exposure, exposure to media all the time, it's, it's kind of hard to grow up that way anymore because you think you, know, you want to aspire to be like all these uh, amazing people who have money to show or houses that are mansions. And that's kind of the, the mentality right now. So, but money is an old issue too, resources. Fighting over resources is not new. And uh, interestingly enough, there's a story in the Bible where money is an issue. And so this is a story today. Our story uh, comes from Luke 12. Jesus gets this, these, like a conflict between two brothers. And this one brother comes to Jesus saying, you know, help me. You know, I want my inheritance. And the word for inheritance in the story is about land, real estate. And so it wasn't just about uh, money. It, he, this guy wanted his share of the land. Now this was not practiced because people, if you think of uh, our understanding of Native Americans and how they uh, tend to see land as a communal 
kind of a, a experience, not something to own and hold on to for yourself or you fence your land. This was kind of the way for, for tribes, for the tribes of uh, the Israelites. They had that sense of the land being in the family. So you farm the land together. And if you remember the stories, uh, they went into the land, uh, the, the land of promise, and they were given uh, land as part of the deal of get, getting into this experience and being the people of God. So it was supposed to stay in the family. The land was not supposed to be sold. It wasn't supposed to be something that you use as to make yourself rich. It was supposed to be something that helped you to sustain uh, an agrarian kind of uh, lifestyle. So the family would work together and the land, the, the bigger the piece together, it worked better than having a, a small piece of land for each group. And so this, what this guy was asking for was unreasonable. And so let's hear how Jesus uh, responded to him. So someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And at first, you know, if you're reading it from our time, you think, what's the problem with that? But it was a big problem uh, for that. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't, never really responds to questions directly, always he uses the question as an opportunity for teaching. And so, but he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on guard, on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. So this is an opportunity. Jesus you know, takes that and says, tells them a parable that challenges their way of thinking. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Now pay attention to how many times he refers to himself. Um, then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. Now mind you, I bet you this guy didn't build any of the stuff on his own. He had workers, he had people doing the work for him. So, but he's looking, I did this, I did all of this. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And so, Jesus says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Now this is, you know, sometimes the story gets used as a condemnation uh, against good financial planning, or, uh, having you know savings or saying you know you should not have any savings you should not you should just give everything but it's not the, it's and it's not a condemnation over people who have more wealth it's a story that really challenges the mentality behind that fear that sense of security see he's now okay i'm gonna build more stuff and i'm gonna make then i'll feel really secure and i love that jesus challenges them by saying you know and what about your life? It's not permanent here, you do realize. Most of us act like we're gonna be here for a long, long time. Now, how many of you woke up this morning and thought, hmm, could this be the last day? But it could be, when you think about it. It's a gift we ha we're here today. It's a gift that we're alive. It's a gift that I'm able to stand and take a breath and speak. It's a gift that you're able to enjoy the gift of life. And it's not a given for us that we're here. And if we keep that in mind, it shifts things. And yeah, think about it. I, I uh, had uh, the privilege of working uh, with a group in, when we lived in Oregon. Uh, they're called the Sacred Art of Living Center. But they started out as the Sacred Art of Dying. Um, and one of the things they learned about working with the dead, with the dying people, is that it, you, get to the place of appreciating life more. When you see the end of life, when it, it's something that is in front of you, when you are aware that this is not permanent for any of us, you start thinking of the values of the soul. You start aligning your life 
with what really matters. Uh, instead of, you know, when, you, when the question comes up and you say, oh, okay, who, what am I going to take on my uh, desert island experience? I'm thinking of the things that are keep me alive. You're thinking of family. You have the right, you have the right attitude. That's exactly what, what would keep us alive. And think about it. People, uh, th all the research shows that people in, uh, with poor economic backgrounds, they come with uh, scarce resources. The, m the most important indicator for that is lack of connections. It's not that they don't have education. It's not just that they don't have access to good jobs. It's because they have lack of access to good relationships. Relationships make a huge difference. And, and places where people are pull themselves out of those uh, adverse situations, it's when they have solid relationships that that support them, people that support them. That's the most important factor because you could pour money on the problem and it doesn't fix it. You see that in a lot of cases. It's like, well, if we could just increase this, the pay, but there is a social aspect to it that we all need. And so, so it's very interesting to think about this parable and to think about it in, as a way to help us, again, not induce, not induce guilt, because, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to ever be greedy. How many of us like to be, uh, to think of ourselves as greedy? Raise your hand. Nobody, nobody likes to think I'm greedy. I'm being, you know, <coughs> selfish. I'm only thinking of number one. We all have that desire in our hearts to help others, to serve, to live a life that's meaningful. We're not here, we, we are never with the illusion that, oh, you know, I'm here to just accumulate money. But somehow it seeps into that place of fear in us. And that's why we act in ways that contradict our values. You know, we value love, we value family, but the minute there is a conflict over inheritance with your family members, all that soul stuff is out the window. And we all can tell stories about that because it's not that foreign to us. And we all come from good families. It's not because we come from bad families, but it is tough talking about money and resources and families and, and inheritance and issues like this because it hits hard on our sense of security. It hits hard on those stories and the wounding that we all have experienced as, as children. So it's important to be intentional, to listen to these stories and say, you know, what is God's grace saying to me today? What is God trying to help me with so I don't have that sense of dread about money? And then the same would be true for others. How do I help people in my life? You may have a child, you may have a friend, you may have someone in your life that, that looks up to you or seeks your counsel. What would you help them with to see that money could be put in its, in its proper place as a conduit to your own values? And so we're gonna watch a video, and this is from Robin Vicky, uh, one of the authors of Your Money or, or Your Life. And we'll do a little bit of discussion after that. That data about overshoot has been a central feature of my life. Like when I learned that, it was just sort of one of those things that's obvious, like certainly we want to change. <laughs> so, um, so the old roadmap, this idea that the earth is a set of infinite resources and the economy can harvest those resources every which way from Sunday in order to produce economic growth that's fundamental, and then it trickles down to the human as more is better. And part of that is as the economy grew, as industrialization permitted more products to be produced uh, with less human labor, uh, there was a sort of a peaking out of, of consumption around the 1920s, and it became a problem. Like, what are we gonna do? So there's several ways to expand markets. One is you export, and another is to educate your citizens to want more than they need. And then you've got an infinite way <laughs> to, you've got an infinite market called the endless willingness of people to uh, buy into the story of more is better and keep buying stuff. So that is the old roadmap. Growth is good, more is better, game over, not talking about the context of our lives, the social context, where fairness is, 
fairness is sort of like built into us. Babies all come with that stamp on them, you know. Fairness is important. And so you cannot, you cannot um, stretch <laughs> fairness and believe that there's no breaking point. Uh, so, so injustice aside, uh, environmental integrity aside, more is better, growth is good, party on. The new roadmap says that there is something called enough. And, and enough is not sort of like this oppressive ceiling that, you know, OK, I've got enough, and I can't have any more. No, enough is this sort of vibrant, vital place. What we teach is an awareness about the flow of money and stuff in your life in light of your true happiness and your sense of purpose and values. And that your enough point, having enough, is having everything you want to need to have a life you love and full self-expression with nothing in excess. It's not minimalism. It's not less is more, because sometimes more is more. But it's that sweet spot. It's the Goldilocks po point. And, and so enough for me is like one of the absolute fulcrums between the old roadmap for money and the new roadmap for money. And, and our surveys of people who followed this program confirm again and again that once people start to pay attention to the flow of money and stuff in their lives in this way, their consumption drops by about 20 to 25 percent naturally because that's the amount of unconsciousness that you have in your spending. So when you become conscious, that falls away. Many people say they don't even know what they used to spend their money on. They just, ooh, surprise. I'm spending less. I don't know how that happened. I just paid attention. I just asked myself, you know, is this purchase of something making me happy? So um, I thought if you could just turn to a neighbor or two or three um, and talk about this idea, maybe discuss this. I, I'll give you also an, another uh, way of dealing with this, share with a neighbor or two when you have felt that you are enough or that you have had enough or you have enough currently. Or you may share about a time when you help someone feel that they have enough or that they are enough. And so, or you could discuss what uh, Vicki Robin uh, talked about. Uh, Robin Vicki, sorry, I switched her name. Uh, and so her concept she part of the book they do is like you start out the book the, the book is intimidating because at first they tell you go back to the first time you earned money and from that time calculate how much money you've earned through the years and then think about all the hours and life energy you gave to that and it's kind of it's it's that's a very interesting concept when you pay attention to that. So anyway, so uh, let's take a few moments to to share. And if you don't want to share, that's fine. You could just sit and reflect. Uh, whatever works best for you.
All right. So, I hate to interrupt you. It sounds like you're having a good conversation. Any anything that you'd like to share? I'll bring a microphone to you if you'd like to share something. Yes. So I was telling uh, my wife and Kathy that um, in uh, one of my previous employments, I worked with uh, Burmese people who are immigrants from Burma, uh -huh. and uh, the w one guy who was friends with Salo, he told me that um, in his country, if he wanted to buy a bottle of beer, mm -hmm. okay, his family wouldn't be able to eat that night because they didn't have enough money. For food. Yeah, yeah. So he immigrated. His family immigrated to the United States. And they had more money than they know what to do with, okay? Mm. Except that they had more expenses than they <laughs> ever had to do with. And he complained, he told me that uh, his son had to have sneakers and he had to have $100 basketball Of course, sneakers. yeah. And this man spent most of his life, I mean, when we worked in the shop together, he was barefoot because he spent most of his life barefoot. Yeah, so. yeah, very different perspective on, on money. Any other thoughts to share? We were talking about where we Did you like earned our first dollar. Where you earned your first dollar, yeah. yeah. Babysitting. And yes. Picking strawberries. Picking strawberries, doing picking all kinds of jobs. Picking Those cucumbers. Ooh, how fun. And we only get so much, maybe a quarter. Yeah. A bushel. Yeah. The first time I picked strawberries, I said, this is the last time. <laughs> that was hard work. It was a hot day, and I, you had to bend down. And I was like, oh, this is not fun. Well, my husband's going to retire in a couple weeks. And one thing we did was talk about money, mm -hmm. obvious. But you know, I don't, I'm not worried about it. I always mm -hmm. told him, it's like, retire. Your health is more important. Mm -hmm. And we'll make it through. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really worried about it, because I know we're going to have enough. Right, yeah. That's great. Yeah, making decisions like that. The tough decisions because the culture is telling you, oh, you know, if you talk to a financial advisor, don't talk to a financial advisor. <laughs> what do you mean retire early? Eww. Yeah. Bad idea. You gotta work. <laughs> they tell you to work until you're 70. Yeah, yeah. Jamie, did you want to say add anything? Yeah. Don't listen to Jamie. The financial guy. He has to watch every, over every, and there's nothing wrong with the planning. There's nothing wrong with the planning and being aware, and, but it's just keeping everything in that mindset of saying, is it serving my values? Yes, maybe I could retire in five years, but maybe I need to retire right now because I want to do something different with my life. Um, who knows what God is calling us to do? Well, when my father passed away, it was one of the things I brought up at his funeral was that Later in his life, when I got to sit down and, and visit with him in the hospital, mm -hmm. and we didn't do a lot of that talk talk stuff during his life, but he thought the best thing that he did for the family was to always have us clothed, fed, and a roof over our head. We weren't rich, mm -hmm. but we were never hungry. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from him living through the depression. Right and being hungry right and not having food on the table right so people really went through a hard time one of the great stories i've heard about this church was during the time of the depression i guess the pastors used to live in what is now crossroads house and i guess that became the back door to a lot of giving of food because farmers would come and bring whatever they could and people would come and take it so there was a sense of that taking care of the community at a time when other communities didn't take care of each other and think about how powerful that is at a time when it's hard but talking about why that's important and those the people from those generations were very aware of what is important um, instead of feeling like they have to be driven by what is you know what's the newest thing I mean our kids a lot of times they want that you know hundred dollars sneakers now it's not a hundred dollars I actually oh I was gonna say I, I went to a store I was horrified I was like 
$165 for sneakers? Why? $200. Um, and these are not like fashionable. They looked really ugly to me too. I was like, <laughs> paying $200 for ugly sneakers? The Hoka, Hoka, I mean, I probably shouldn't, Hoka? Yeah, it's like, it's the thing people are talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I may, don't, I do wear Birkenstocks. I'm aware that they're expensive, but I try to keep them a long time. Um, you know, and, and to wear just a pair of sneakers that's gonna be in six months not, you know, around because you keep them until your spouse throws, throws them out. Why not? Why not keep the stuff over and over? Because you know, I, I'm fine, you know, I'm feeling comfortable. They're, they still look good. They are, these are probably eight years old, you know? That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I'm happy. I mean, they're fine. But to think about the, the mentality all the time that's telling us new is better, more is, is better. And the game is really based on the sense of overconsumption and that it's gonna make us happier. It doesn't matter at the end of the day if our, our values are not aligned. Think about the most joy you've ever had from giving some, something to someone. It's always more fun when I receive things, and it's okay, I, I appreciate it, but when I give something, it's more joyful. It's always more joyful, and I'm not the only one. I know that for a fact from people. People always enjoy giving more than getting uh, stuff. And so today we'll end with, unless there is a burning point that anybody wants to make, that speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I never do that for weddings. I don't know why they say that in movies. You know, I, you ever watch movies and you see some, like the funerals? I'm like, what, what funeral is that? That's not how we do it. But um, today, I hope that you'll go thinking about these words and reflecting on them. And if you are in a place of uh, feeling enough, maybe you can uh, pray about how God could help you model that or help somebody in your own life. And so we're gonna end with these words from Jesus, and this is from Matthew 6. Again, this is about putting our, aligning our priorities uh, with the kingdom of God. And so he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So read that with me if you don't mind. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So take these words, Keep them upon your heart. The next time you feel like you're not enough, uh, God has put a lot of treasure in your life. So many treasures, so many gifts, and it's hard to believe it. When we look at our lives, we don't always feel like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm God's gift to the world, because that feels like, ah, that's not true. But it is true. Each of you is a gift from God to our world. And this, this treasure, the treasure that you have, invested in what really matters and, uh, and let your soul dictate for you what each day is going to look like, where you're gonna spend your time and when, where you're gonna invest your energy. And so I'm gonna invite us to move into communion. And this is the invitation to, uh, one of the practical things about the Christian faith is that we have an experience that is, uh, down to earth, all of us, each of us has to eat each day. How many times do you eat each day? I mean, um, five times, too many times? Yeah, sometimes we have a bad relationship with food too. But the table at its essence is about nourishment, is about that sense of uh, coming together to experience that grace. When uh, you look back at your childhood, there are many nourishing memories of meals prepared with love and care. People who uh, prepared a special cake for you, or people who said, you know, let's have Sunday dinner together. Or, or you may be doing that right now. And I know this month we are all preparing for the Thanksgiving feast. And why I, it's my favorite uh, holiday, by the way, of the whole year, because there's no consumption except for food. But I mean, there's no consumption, but coming to the table. You're not giving gifts. You're not trying to outdo anybody. You're just coming with family or friends 
to share a feast. And I hope that this table is the same kind of spirit for us. It's a reminder, it's a practical reminder that Christ left for us to come to remind ourselves that there is enough for each of us. And each of us is invited to this table because the table is that of grace. And so we remember and we come preparing our hearts to receive this gift and knowing that each of us is invited, invited the same. So let's take a moment to pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of your grace, for the feast of your love, a reminder, a foretaste of your heavenly feast of love where all of us belong. Help us today to experience that sense of being enough, of having enough, of your grace being enough for each of us that we may go out into the world living and proclaiming this message of hope in a world of scarcity and fear, competition and war. Help us to let this table show us a different vision of life. For we pray this in the way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our example. Amen. And so we come remembering that on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after giving thanks to God, he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from it, do this in remembrance of me. And the great news of our faith is that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we experience and proclaim this gift of God's love for us. So I invite you to come forward and receive these gifts. And the invitation is to take a piece of bread and uh, dip it in the cup or take a piece of bread and a cup to go and partake as you are able. And there is a gluten-free option. Both this is gluten-free option and in the little cup. So come for all is ready.
and we pray. God, we give you thanks for these gifts and for meeting us in this way, in this place. And we pray that we may go out into the world living by your grace. Amen. Come on in, tresses. Sorry. <laughs> Junie, go ahead. Sorry, I rushed. I thought we were done. <laughs> and if anybody remained seated and couldn't come forward, just raise your hand and we'll bring the elements to you. Anybody? No? We're good? for the blessing, uh, the words that came to my mind actually as we were uh, singing and praying uh, is, is the sense of joy. I pray that we will have a sense of joy around money, that our souls will inform our money and our sense of worth in life, that we may experience the abundance of God's life and be those who proclaim that good news to others. Money can slip through our fingers, so can precious minutes of our lives. Both can be wasted if we don't pay attention. May the Holy Spirit give us the grace to pay more attention to the money we spend and the minutes we spend. We pray to use both of them wisely and with a sense of divine grace and joy. Peace before you, peace behind you, peace above you, peace beneath you, peace at your right, peace at your left peace within and all around you, this day and forevermore. Amen.